I'm going to ask you to stand one more time and open your Bibles to the book of Genesis, chapter 22. Genesis chapter 22. And follow along as I read a few verses. And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I am. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I will tell thee of. And Abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled his ass, and took two of his young men with him, and Isaac his son, and clave the wood for the burnt offering, and rose up and went into the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day Abraham lifted up his eyes, and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac his son, and he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and they went both of them together. And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father and said, My father, and he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold the fire in the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went both of them together. And they came to the place which God had told him of, and Abraham built an altar there, and laid the wood in order, and bound Isaac his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son thine only son from thee. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. And Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah-Jireh, as it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. And the angel of the Lord called unto Abraham out of heaven the second time. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for the opportunity to get together and worship the wonderful, wonderful God of heaven. And we thank you this morning, Heavenly Father, for that sacrifice of your only begotten Son, our Lord, that through him and acceptance of him, we might have eternal life. Father, as we come this morning, if there is one among us who does not know Jesus Christ as Savior, I pray that this would be the day of that one's salvation. Father, as we come together corporately, we want to lift our prayers to the throne of grace for Amy Foster this morning. Father, continue to heal her, cure that infection, and enable her to walk again. And Father, we think of our community friend Malcolm Parks as having suffered from a stroke. We pray, Father, that you'll do a wondrous work in him. Lift him up as well. Father, as we continue to pray, I ask that you will open the eyes of each one here that we might behold wondrous things out of thy law. Calm our hearts, calm our fears, encourage us, Father, and might we look to thee for the blessings that you promise in the week ahead. And we'll thank you for the wonderful things you're going to bring about in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. May be seated. (coughs) 
And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I am. This verse said, It came to pass after these things. And immediately you and I would ask ourselves, What things is being talked about? He's talking about all the things that had gone before in his life. And now, climaxing in the expulsion of Hagar and Ishmael, over and over again, Abraham had been challenged to a life of surrender. You and I don't really understand what a life of surrender consists of. We declare that we are living in a life, we're living a life of surrender when we say, I have given myself, I have given my money, I have given my talents, and I have sold out for Jesus. But just about the time you and I think that we have gotten to the place where we have given our all, the Lord reveals another area of our life that we need to work on. In the life of Abraham, first it had been his father, and now his son. In between had been the well-watered plains of Jordan and the gifts of Sodom's kings, and then Ishmael. Abraham is no doubt standing, looking, and asking himself if it could be true after he had given God so much already that God wanted more. The aged Abraham recalls giving up in his youth all of his friends, all of his wealth, all of his family, his home. And now God wants him to give up his only son. With each new encounter, God was preparing Abraham to climb Mount Moriah. If you and I knew what tomorrow was going to bring or next week was going to bring or next month or maybe next year what was going to happen in our lives, we might be tempted to take that jump off a cliff somewhere. I'm glad that with each new encounter, God gives us grace for the journey. Aren't you? Amen. Where in all of God's word could we search, except in Genesis 22, to find a picture of what Calvary really meant to God? If you really want to discover what Calvary means to our Heavenly Father, Go to Psalm 69 or Isaiah 53 or Psalm 22. God tested Abraham in this chapter, Genesis 22. And what a wonderful, awesome test it was. I want to share something with you this morning let you know that if God is doing the testing, you can pass the test. It wasn't because Abraham obeyed God that he felt he could trust in God, but because he trusted in God, he could obey him. <clears throat> Look at verse uh, number two of this same chapter. And he said, Take now thy son, Thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. That word Moriah means foreseen of Jehovah. Don't you dare for a moment believe that God has a dark side, because there's nothing absolutely nothing that takes God by surprise. There's nothing that sneaks up on God. 
When I was a little boy, visiting on the farm of either of my grandfathers, and I did something that would surprise me, I would say, oops. But in vo God's vocabulary, there aren't any oops, because God knows all things. Now in verse 3, and Abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled his ass and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son and clave the wood for the burnt offering and rose up and went unto the place of which God had told him. This verse gives a very vivid and explicit picture of Calvary. Abraham learned about the cross that day even though Calvary, as we understand it, was still hundreds of years in the future. It says in this verse that he went unto the place. How that place must have haunted him as he traveled that three days journey, going to that place that God had prompted him to visit. It certainly hallowed him. We're going to look at the entire verse later, but in verse 4 it says that on the third day Abraham lifted up his eyes and he saw the place. And in verse 9 it says, and they came unto the place. This was an echo resounding down through the ages of time revealing a specific place. In the New Testament in Luke 3, 23 rather, 33, we read, and when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, there they crucified him and the malefactors, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Look at Genesis 22.4. Then on the third day Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. The third day. Abraham had three days to develop of deep faith that would be unshaken. And he began that three-day journey knowing that at the end of the trip there was a mountain and at the top of that mountain he must offer his son. He no doubt wondered if God was going to keep the promise which he had long trusted in. Numbers are pretty important things in the Word of God. For instance, the number three is the number of resurrection. And you'll see that lesson of resurrection more completely and clearly in Genesis 22:5. And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship, and come again to you. You stay here, he said. I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again. You know, all of our worship is based upon the resurrection. If there's no resurrection, there's no reason for us to meet and worship. Thank God he is alive and he's coming back. He's coming again for his bride. We're told to wait for him. He said, the lad and I will come again. You ask, has he decided not to obey God? No, I don't believe so. I think that at this point in Abraham's experience, his life shifted into high, a high gear of faith. He didn't know what God would do. He didn't know how God would do it. But he was going as God had directed him going to trust and he was going to trust God to do it. So Abraham said unto his servants, you wait here and the lad and I will go yonder and worship. If you were to look at Mark chapter 14 and verse 33 to 35, you'll see that Jesus came to a place in his earthly life where he turns to his beloved friends and says, you wait here. I must go on alone. 
if you have never had a Mariah moment, you will have at some point in your life. You'll come to the point in your life where you'll have to go on alone. You won't be able to take your mother or your father, your sister or brother. You won't be able to take your preacher or a friend. You'll have to go alone and face God alone. In Genesis 22, 6, we read, And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac his son. And he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and they went both of them together. Many years ago, one of my sons was home on leave after basic training for service in the Navy. And he came into my office. At that time, he was about the same size as I was. And he flexed his arm. You know how young teenagers do. They've got to prove their metal. <clears throat> and he said, Poppy, that's what my children call me. He said, look at this. It's steel. He said, hit me. I thought, glory to God, isn't this good? <laughs> so I reared back and I hit him. And he looked at me and said, is that all you can do? Try it again. So I reared back again and I hit him with all I had. And he never flinched. He went into the other room and told his mother, he says, Poppy can hit pretty good for an old guy. I went into the bathroom where my cries couldn't be heard. <laughs> said, God, don't let my hand be broken. <laughs> but I learned something that day. I learned that both of my older sons could whip me. And here's the lesson. Abraham was an old man and Isaac was a young man. And he could have resisted. Could have said no. Dad, I'm not climbing that mountain. We have the wood and the fire. But I want to tell you something, Dad. I've been to worship before. You're getting senile. We don't have a sacrifice to offer. But no, Isaac didn't say that. Abraham strapped the wood to Isaac's back and he climbed the mountain with his father willingly. As the years passed, there would be another son who would climb that same mountain, who would also be carrying wood for the sacrifice, and there that son would die for my sins and for yours. Isaac speaks in verse 7, and Isaac spake unto Abraham his father and said, My father, and he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham didn't know where, he didn't know when. But he knew God would provide the sacrifice. In the years that I pastored that little church in the country in Osceola, I've stood with a couple of parents in baby land, and I've buried their little babies, and often they had little ones. They carried their little ones in their arms, or they could have other babies. But Abraham had only one son. He was a son of promise. And there would be no more sons born to Abraham and Sarah. In verse 8, Abraham states that God will provide the sacrifice. And then in verse 9, they come to the place where God had told him of. Abraham built the altar and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood with deliberate care, each act is set down. 
the altar, the wood, and the binding of the victim. In verse 10, Abraham stretched forth his hand to take the knife to slay his son. Abraham looks down at his knife, and there's no word from God. He pulls a knife from its sheath, and still there's no word from God. Abraham brings that knife up and looks at it, and still no word from God. Brought that knife up fully poised, and there's still no word from God. But just as he starts to bring that knife down, the answer came. I want you to be assured this morning that while God may never be in a hurry, he is never one second late. God will always be there, and he'll be right on time. I want you to look with me here. Abraham is standing by his son, who was on the altar, and he's looking down into the eyes of his son and he's got the knife in his hand and he's realizing for the first time in his life that he's going to have to play the part of the priest. Abraham's mind turns back to the time when he was just a small boy at home and one day his father came to him and said, Son, here's a wee lamb. I want you to protect it. You can't let him get in a fight. You can't let him get scratched. You can't let him get hurt. He's to be without a mark. And one day soon, son, we're going, to, we're going down to worship. You're getting old enough now that you can take a lamb. Abraham raised that little lamb, and everywhere that Isaac went, that little lamb went. One day his dad came in and said, Well, son, it's time. And Isaac said, No, daddy, not my little lamb. It's my lamb. It sleeps with me. It eats with me. And wherever I go, it goes. He said, But son, I told you what it was for. So off they go. Abraham looks down at that little trembling lamb, and that little lamb looks back at him with eyes that seem to say, if you'll just pick me up and hug me, everything's going to be all right. Once in a while, I used to eat a little bowl of cereal before I went to bed. I still do occasionally, but looking back, I remember as I was doing that, my little beagle dog, Hoover, would sit there looking at me. He's got his head propped up on my knee. He's trying to stay awake to get my milk, begging with his eyes, not unlike that little lamb. That little lamb was begging Abraham with his eyes. But it's not a lamb now. It's a son. And that son is shaking and quivering on that altar. The son looks up with his eyes and he seems to say, Dad, if you'll just take me and hug me and hold me, I think everything will be all right. Many years later on that same mountain, there's another father and another lamb hanging on a tree with his eyes full of mercy. He looks up and he cries, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? I believe the father looked down and said, just a little while, son, 
I'll hug you and I'll hold you. For it's going to be over in a little while. And then he cried, it is finished. And bowed his head. And in a very short while, he was in his father's arms. I want to take you to another place this morning. Many years ago, a young man attending revival services of, at the request of his neighbors and his wife walked down the aisle of a little country church. They were singing, Just As I Am. And the preacher said, Behold, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. That was Dr. Red Morrell, who at that time was the evangelist for the Committee on Missionary Evangelism out of Elyria, Ohio. And just as I was, I looked up and saw those eyes of mercy and those outstretched arms. You'll have to forgive me. But I fairly jumped up into the arms of Jesus and loved him. And I've loved him ever since. And I'm telling you this morning that he's the Lamb of God. He's the Lamb of God who gave his life for the sins of this world. Look with me at verses 20, uh, 12 and 13. And he said, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him, for now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. God intervened and said to Abraham, I know you fear me. And then in 13, Abraham lifted up his eyes and behold, behind him was a ram caught in the thicket by his horns. I believe that when Abraham saw that ram in the thicket, the ropes were untied, and he and his son together grabbed that ram and put him on the altar. I believe they shouted around that altar, and they had a time of celebration. And Isaac looked at his father and said, Dad, that ram took my place, didn't he? And you and I can shout glory, because Jesus has taken our place also. Verse 14, And Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah-Jireh, as it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. Jehovah-Jireh means God will provide. Only God sees the end as well as the beginning. He is the Alpha and the Omega. He's infallible in all of his purposes and all of his plans. God is a great provider for all of our needs and all of our necessities. When, Isaac, when Abraham and Isaac went up the mountain, they knew about sacrifice. When they came down, they knew about substitution. All of the sacrifices you may have read about in the Old Testament, in the tabernacle, in the temple services, all of the sacrifices pointed toward Calvary. The coats of skins were covering were covering uh, for Ab Abel's sacrifice was for acceptance. Abraham and Isaac's sacrifi sacrifice spoke of substitution. The Passover lamb represented deliverance from wrath. The burnt offering spoke about acceptance, while the peace offering spoke about peace and fellowship with God. The trespass offering was for forgiveness. The atonement was just for that, the atonement making us at one with Christ, or making the offerer at one with Christ. The red heifer was for cleansing. The birds in Leviticus 14 spoke of justification. The suffering lamb represented Christ crucified, who in weakness was and is our strength. 
But the Jews were hemmed in by a thousand uh, commands and prohibitions. Uh, form and ceremonies were abundant. The Jew was always in danger of becoming unclean. A multitude of laws uh, and sins of ignorance always stood in his way. He must be perpetually in fear lest he should be cut off from the people of God. When he had done his best on any given day, he always had to ask the question, have I done enough? He knew he wasn't finished. No Jew would ever talk of a finished work. The bullock would be offered, but then he would have to do it again. The lamb was offered, and the Passover was celebrated with holy rites. But it had to be celebrated again and again. The priest would go within the veil and put that blood, sprinkled blood on the mercy seat once a year. But he had to do it year after year after year. All of the sacrifices of the Old Testament pointed to one sacrifice which would please God for time and eternity. The bullock represented the burden-bearing Savior. So the bullocks were slain, millions of them, through the century. The scapegoat pictured one who would carry the sins of the people off into the wilderness and away from the presence of God. The turtle dove was offered in sacrifice and its head wrung off and the blood poured out, picturing the one who would be the man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. The lamb pictured the innocent, defenseless one, dying without a murmur for the guilty. Therefore, the lamb was slain. The lamb that was slain was the favorite sacrifice of all. The Passover feast was celebrated once a year. One lamb for a family. Uh, perhaps one lamb for two families if the one family was too small. But uh, we can be sure that the lamb was, may have been too large for a family. But was never too large. the family was never too large for the lamb. On a certain day every year, over a quarter of a million lambs were slain. And this went on for 1,500 years at an estimated $75 million to teach us about sacrifice. Let me ask you something this morning. If men of old would spend $75 million to give us a picture of Christ in sacrifice, <clears throat> and if God would give us a, if God would give his son as a sacrifice for our sins. Would it be too much to give ourselves to him? I have a few more questions and then I'll answer them for you. Where is the lamb? First of all, I want to say to you that this blessed lamb is in the book that you and I call the Bible. The Bible calls him advocate, Adam, apostle, and ancient of days. The Bible calls him the bread, the bridegroom, the begotten of the Father, and the brightness of the Father's image. The Bible calls him covenant, counsel, the cornerstone, and the king Christ. The Bible calls him the everlasting Father, the first fruit of heaven that slept.
understand why your religion grows faster than ours. And he said, it's very simple. He said, let your leader be born of a virgin and then die and be resurrected on the third day and ascend into heaven. The difference is that we have a living God. The two men asked, why seek ye the living among the dead? He is not here, but he is risen. As we view the Christ child in the manger, we can see a number of things. Christ, I see the heir of all things in Hebrews 1-2. Christ, I see where the fullness dwells in Colossians 1.19. In, in Christ, I see the image of the invisible God in Colossians 1.15. In Christ, I see a more excellent name than that given to angels in Hebrews 1.4. In Christ, I see the brightness of the Father's image and glory in Hebrews 1.3. In Christ, I see the head of the church in Colossians 1.18, and in Christ I see the author of eternal salvation, in Hebrews 5, 8 and 9. Where's the lamb? He's in the manger wrapped in swaddling clothes, but he's more than a babe. He's the son of God. And I ask you again, where's the, son, where's the lamb? He's at the Lord's Supper. Jesus commanded that when we take part in the Lord's Supper, we are to do so in remembrance of him. I wonder as I look out over all of you folks here this morning, how long it has been since some of you communed with your Lord at his table of remembrance. As often as you do it, you're regularly reminded. I ask you again, where is the lamb? in the garden, Luke 22, 44. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was as it were great drops of blood falling down to the ground. His sorrow and pain was not occasioned by agony in the garden. Spiritual agony was, was what he went through in the garden, not physical agony. His Father put him to grief for us. His Heavenly Father would fill a cup and give it to his son to drink. It wasn't the Jews. It wasn't Judas. It wasn't the sleepy disciples. But it was his Heavenly Father who filled that cup for him to drink. He who knew no grief was put to grief for us. When he prayed, he didn't pray, Father, if it be your will, spare me of the humility. He didn't pray, Father, if it be your will, spare me the thorns. He prayed, Father, if it be thy will, let this cup pass from me. He who was without sin had to bear the sins of the entire world upon his shoulders. He who knew no sin had the sins of the entire world dumped on him. He was looked upon by God in those brief but agonizing hours as though he had committed every sin of mankind down through the ages. All hell was distilled in that cup which our Savior must drink at the hand of his Father. <coughs> and I ask you again, where is the Lamb? yonder on Calvary where he paid the ransom price he paid the debt he redeemed you and me the law said cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree the law had a dreadful curse it declared that anyone who violated the law should be put to death Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by being made a curse for us. The law kept God's chosen people in bondage, in fear and in dread. 
thanks to the work of Christ on Calvary, we can now declare that we have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but we have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. That term of endearment for a Lord who gave us all on our behalf. Our Passover is complete. Our righteousness is finished. Our victim is slain. Our priest has gone within the veil and the blood has been sprinkled. God said it is enough. And this old world, as if she were only a few moments old, began to quake and to shake and tremble at the, during those awful hours when darkness came upon the land. The loud railings that had been offered were reduced to murmurs. Murmurs were reduced to whispers. And whispers were reduced to hushes. And then dead silence. Seeing Christ hanging on that cross, silent now was the mocking high priest. Speechless now was the jeering crowd. Stupefied now were the German or the Roman soldiers, and smitten with grief are all of our Lord's friends. And they hear him cry, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Where is the lamb? He's down by the garden tomb. We read this in John 26. Then cometh Simon Peter following him and went into the sepulcher and seeth the linen clothes lie and going on into seven and eight. And the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself, then went in that other disciple, which came first to the sepulcher, and he saw and believed. At the tomb they saw the clothes, but not the Savior. Now you may wonder about that and think that's kind of shocking, but it isn't shocking to me. If you've ever traveled, and I presume most of you have, some place or other, some places you go, you take certain clothing because you know the conditions are going to be such that you need some special kind of clothing <clears throat> for a certain climate. Another place you go, you take different clothing. But Jesus left the gray clothes behind because he knew he wasn't going to need them again. And there's no reason for taking them. Nine verses of history are given in our Bible for that exact arrangement. The clothes were in order. The napkin was still folded. Now if thieves had taken the body of Jesus, they wouldn't have folded the clothes. They'd have been in too much of a hurry. Friends wouldn't have taken them because no Jew would have carried the body out naked. And the grave clothes were still there, and the napkin was by itself, and it was folded. And that's significant. The Jewish servant, or slave, when the master came home at night, would set the table. Then the slave would go and to the doorway of the home and stand there, not saying a word, but the servant and the master had ways of communicating. And if the master for some reason got up from the table, took his napkin, then threw it down and walked away, then the servant would come and he'd come into that room and he'd clean up the table. But if the master got up, wiped his face, and took that napkin and folded it in, folded it and walked away. Then a slave wouldn't touch the table. That servant knew that the master was coming back. And when they saw 
They had pulled a neck and they knew that Jesus was coming back. I want you to notice something about that tomb this morning. Its price was high. It wasn't a common grave. It was a priceless tomb. Someone once said, wasn't it nice that somebody, someone loaned him a tomb? Yes, it was. But if he could wait for three days, he could have it back. It was a borrowed grave. Christ really didn't have anything that was his own, yet he owned everything. But the swaddling clothes in which he was wrapped at birth weren't his own. The barn where he was laid in the manger wasn't his own. He slept in another man's bed. He rode another man's beast. He had the last supper in another man's room. Even that crown of thorns and the cross were not his. They were yours and mine. Then the grave was cut from a rock. Imagine that. The rock of ages buried in a rock. The grave had never had an occupant. An old time evangelist of the 16th, 1600s, Christopher Ness, said when Christ was born, he laid in a virgin womb. When he died, he laid in a virgin tomb. The tomb had a message. When you and I view the lamb, the tomb in which the Lamb of God lay, we see the grave clothes in the napkin. We're to remember that grave, that, that tomb was a, a dressing room. We are in a dressing room in our Christian lives. In preparation for that day, when we cast away the tent of this earthly tabernacle and put on that robe of righteousness and are ushered into the presence of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Let me ask you one last time. Where is the Lamb? Where is the Lamb in your life? You say, I'm a Christian. Yes. But have you looked in his eyes lately? Does he have all of you? Where's the lamb in your life? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, help us to be more thankful for the Christ of Calvary. Help us as we go from this place today to reflect the love of Christ that others may see. Father, help us to remember that he gave us all that we might be free of sin and doubt and worry and discouragement and all of those things that plague us and keep us from being the kind of men and women and boys and girls that our Lord wants us to be. Before we leave this place today, Father, with every head bowed and every eye closed, I want to ask that question that our preacher always asks. Is there anyone here today that does not know for sure that they're bound for heaven? If there is someone here at this moment that's not sure of their salvation, just want to raise up that hand. I'm not going to call you out or embarrass you in any way. But this will just be an, an opportunity for you to share with me that you're not sure of your salvation or perhaps you have never trusted Christ as your Savior. Or God's Word says that today is the day of salvation. Is there one here this morning who would raise that hand that I share with you the love of Christ and show you how you can be bound for eternity. I don't see any hands. 
but should you think on this matter after you after the service is over you still may be free to come and speak to me or one of our men that we might share with you the wonderful <clears throat> gospel of Jesus Christ father again I thank you for this opportunity we've had to worship together bless us now as we wind our way homeward help us to meditate on the things of Scripture that we've heard this morning and return tonight rejoicing that we have another opportunity to hear from our wonderful God through his word we'll thank you in our wonderful name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ amen <clears throat>